Hello, my name is Douglas Finlay and this is my colleague Sean Rees from the Oxford Academic Health Science Network. We would like to welcome you to this series of short video clips that have been put together following three webinars that we held in 2020. The title of the webinars was Inclusion for All, Working with Seldom Heard Groups. These webinars were supported by the Working Together Partnership, a coalition of organisations in the Thames Valley who collaborate to support co-production in research, education and service delivery. The term seldom heard refers to groups of people who may be less likely to be heard by professionals and decision makers. They're sometimes referred to as hard to reach groups, though this term has been criticised for implying that there's something about these people that makes their engagement with services difficult. Seldom heard places more of the emphasis on agencies to engage these service users, carers and potential service users. There are many factors that can contribute to people who use services being less likely to being heard, including disability, ethnicity, sexuality, communication impairments, mental health problems, homelessness or geographical isolation. For these initial webinars, we focused on three groups, sensory impairment, learning disabilities and the LGBTQ plus community. There is a recording for each of these. We hoped that by inviting our speakers to describe their and other members of their community's experience, this would help all of us to appreciate the world from their point of view and help us to better involve them in our work. We specifically asked speakers to detail their hints and tips on how to do this. We also hope that by listening to our speakers, it would help to reduce our natural tendency for unconscious bias by making us reflect on how we view people who are different from us. Unconscious bias refers to our automatic patterns of thinking, which leads to decisions and judgments about other people that are often unfair and can therefore be seen as a form of prejudice. In order to get these people thinking about unconscious bias, we used a short video from the Royal Society, which can be found in the link below. We very much hope that you will enjoy listening to our speakers and find it informative. If you want any further information, then please do get in touch with us in the first instance. We've included our contact details below. Hope you enjoy. My name's Nicholas, Nick Bray, and um, I, uh, my nom de guerre is uh, transgender conduit. Uh, who am I? Um, I've been uh, reassigned now for um, over 30 years uh, and I've also been working alongside uh, organisations for nearly as long as that, so um, there's quite a bit of knowledge going on there. Uh, next slide please. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, uh, transgender and non-binary because here to, I'm here today to try and scotch a few myths. Um, when we are born, quick glance between the legs and if a penis and testes is there, you are assigned male. If a vulva is there, you are assigned female. And if in one in 2000 births they're unsure, you are assigned um, intersex. And that is what is pretty much goes on your birth certificate is your physical external sex. Uh, next slide, please. This is completely different to the sex that is in your head, your gender identity, or how you express yourself, your gender expression. And if you have a look at the, um, uh, the oh, I was gonna say it's uh, fallen off the bottom. That's never good. Um, <laughs> if you have a look at the double-headed arrow there, it's either, it goes between either 100% man or boy, or 100% um, woman or girl, or anywhere in between. We all, as with physical sex, we're all different. We all are on that scale uh, and we all vary. And when you express yourself, that's different as well. So you could, for example, but um, be, say, like myself, I was assigned female at birth. I'm actually fairly non-binary in my head, but also, as you can see, uh, I sort of express myself more as a man. But the majority of people um, are they stay on the same side of that. So they will be assigned either male or female. They are um, gender identity wise, they're either male or female in their head and they express themselves within those two parameters. But it isn't static and you do move around that during your life. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the myth busters round. So I've now introduced trans and non-binary people. We are not as reported in the media definitely social media. 
we do appear in every culture. It's not just a Western thing. And in fact, Eastern cultures in many ways are much more accepting of this than Western cultures are. We have been around for a very long time. Last week, I was actually looking at, um, it was uh, somebody talking about ancient Greece. And there was evidence that there were people who were being born into one sex, but actually living another gender identity. We do cover and cross all social and economic boundaries. I'm as poor as a church mouse, but then you've got the Kardashians who are definitely not. We are not, trans and non-binary is not, repeat, not a mental illness. There may be mental health issues as a result of the problems and issues that trans and non-binary people have, but it is not a mental illness. But it is part of natural variation. It's like height, weight, eye colour, um, we are all different, but one thing we really, really do need is help and support from medical services sometimes to help us reassign those people who really do feel they need that, so hormones and surgery, but a lot more dignity and respect in this country, please, because we seem to have lost our way. Next slide, please. So how many people are we talking about? 11 years ago, that's 11 years ago, um, there was a guesstimate that there is um, at least 1% of the population is um, transgender, nothing about non-binary people. But it did grossly underestimate other types of hidden gender because some people just call themselves man or woman, so they're going to be difficult to detect after they have reassigned. We don't collect population figures in this country of the trans and non-binary community, however, there might be an inkling of this next year when we begin on the census to predict, to actually start collecting figures. But if we have a look at other countries, we are talking probably um, over 1% now, 2 maybe 3%, some places say 5%. So that's over a million people. What we're talking here, it could be as many, so one in every 67th person could be identifying as trans and non-binary. And that's really important because it could mean that we are grossly underestimating the actual population here. We do think that that could be uh, increasing by 20% every five years, but it does vary down, vary up. But, but because we have problems at the moment, that could be down, but next year it may increase. Next slide, please. So some of the problems that we are facing at the moment and one look at the media, whether it be um, television, newspaper or social media, social exclusion and isolation, bullying, harassment, abuse and hate. And some of this can be unconscious. Loss of family, home and employment. High levels of anxiety and depressive states due to minority stress. This is where the mental health issues come and they are getting worse. And when they are really bad, we're talking about a suicide rate that we suggest is between 42 and 47 percent, but is on the rise because of some of the problems and issues we have in this country, which is including lockdown. Go for the next slide, please. There's been quite a bit of law about this. One of the um, interesting ones is the very top one there, which is uh, dated 1970. It was to annul a celebrity marriage. But what it did in one fell swoop was saying that it's two men that are married. So as soon as that happened, the birth certificate, um, the ability to change the birth certificate disappeared. And subsequent law, so the Sex Discrimination Act and the Data Protection Act that gave us a bit of privacy, um, next slide, please. Didn't actually steadily move towards the Gender Recognition Act. The Gender Recognition Act was to correct that 1970. So we're talking 34 years later. But what it actually did, it, it doesn't mean that you can change your birth certificate. What you can actually do is apply for a gender recognition certificate that although is indistinguishable from a birth certificate, still means that there still is that historical reference to your original birth sex. There has been subsequent law to that, the goods and services, but then these were all amalgamated bar the Gender Recognition Act together in the Equality Act. Next slide, please. We also had increasing data protection, so we had even more um, assistance to make sure that we had priv privacy that other people were having. But then in 2016, 
it was decided that um, there needed to be um, an amendment going through with the Gender Recognition Act because of the increasing amount of people who were um, identifying as non-binary. They did not have any rights whatsoever. And I'm sorry to have to say, even though 104,000 people, so we are talking about effectively a mandate to change the law, overwhelmingly said, yes, let's change the law. Last month, it was decided to shelve this. And last week, it was decided to have, well, let's have yet another inquiry. So it means that we are now put back, I would say, at least a year, if not longer. So to finish, could I have the last slide, please? I beg your pardon. There's the um, a. Um, it's uh, basically the um, all the law that we've had so far. I have missed out some of the law that moved up to the Gender Recognition Act. And now can we have the last slide, please? <laughs> um, I'd like to leave you with this thought. I took this photo at uh, Pride in London in 1998. Um, the uh, woman on the right is the father of the woman on the left. And as you can see, they're holding up a banner there that says transgender rights are human rights, and it is 1998. Despite all the changes in law, we have to ask ourselves a serious question. Are we actually sliding back towards that with our attitudes? Because if we are, this is something that we need to guard against. Thank you. I work at Birmingham LGBT um, as the Lesbian and Bisexual Women's Sexual Health Outreach Worker, um, which is a ridiculously long title, apologies. Um, but at the charity that I work at, our vision is to create a vibrant, diverse, lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans community in Birmingham and the surrounding areas in which individuals can realise their full potential and have equal access and opportunities. Um, and like Nick was saying just there as well, um, unfortunately, as this is our aim um yes and leg legislation has been changed unfortunately sometimes it feels that we are sliding away from that um so i want to really talk to you today about some recommendations we can make to practice to research um and other all, all things in between really and how we can improve the lives of lgbt plus people um, and how we can really make a difference to the services that they, they access, how they experience things in life. And hopefully my aim is, well, my personal aim, professional aim, um, being someone that identifies as a part of the community myself um, and someone that supports, supports the community as well, is that we can improve those rates of suicide for transgender and non-binary people for LGBT plus people um, in general and hopefully improve the mental health and well-being of those people as well. Um, but in um, my chat in Birmingham, we provide a range of services for LGBT plus people um, and community. And those include, um, but are not limited to counselling, support for young trans people, sexual health services, domestic violence support and referral pathways into other services such as LGBT specific support for survivors of sexual abuse. So I want to talk to you about a few recommendations um, that are quite easy to put into practice. Um, I never want to give anybody a really, really complicated um, suggestion or something that's going to take a lot of money because we know that a lot of services don't have that kind of money to fund um, you know, a specific LGBT project or a specific piece of research. So it's very much thinking about what we can do, what we can change instantly, and then what we can also put in as a long-term plan to improve the experiences of LGBT people. Um, and the first thing I want to talk to you about is trying to make services more mobile where possible. So engaging in public clinics into spaces where LGBT people feel safe. Um, so for example, at our um, charity, I work in the sexual health team, we actually take our sexual health services, um, so that could be wellbeing or HIV and STI testing, we take them into the community um, in Birmingham, in the gay village as we call it, we take it into the bars, the restaurants, we might take it into the clubs as well, um, obviously not at the moment, 
um, so pre-COVID. Um, we find that's really, really positive in getting people to engage because they're already in an environment where they feel comfortable. And that's really important um, in trying to support people and also getting them to be, involved, be more involved in services that are for them or research. Um, I also talk a lot about amplifying the voices of LGBT people to promote certain services. So, for example, um, every year during March, we have LGBT Women's Health Week. And what a lot of organisations do is encourage, um, not, not force, <laughs> but encourage the um, people that are maybe out to their colleagues um, to, if they feel confident, to jump onto social media, to be more present, not only during these weeks, at any other week as well, but to really promote um, how important these weeks are and, and how they can change, you know, healthcare for the future as well. And one of the other important things I want to talk to you about is recognising the importance of pronouns. This is a topic that can get really, really complicated. People can get really confused. Um, and when I talk about pronouns, I mean she, her, they, them, he, him, for example. And one of the things I would always recommend where possible is that people try and um, use pronoun badges or encourage pronoun badges for staff. This not only makes it more open for um, people accessing services to discuss their pronouns, it also just provides a little bit of confidence in the service, knowing that, you know, that, that service provider understands what pronouns are, which means maybe I can use my preferred pronoun. And in, when I say this, it means not, not the pronoun that people would presume from maybe, um, you know, a physical appearance or how somebody's voice sounds, for example, but that's a, a preferred pronoun means the one that they want to use, not the one they feel they have to use. So this is really important for a lot of trans and non-binary people being able to live as, as they want to live, as, as they want to be, you know, seen and respected as say for example um, a non-binary person not how they appear on the outside to other people um, and one of the things I think we need to look at not in a negative a negative light but in order to improve services in the future is look at where experiences of LGBT people have gone wrong one of those is I always talk about is is the personal experience but I think we can use it to move forward and improve services is as a lesbian woman myself trying to access contraception for purposes other than pregnancy prevention is one of the hardest things to do um, and that's for a lot of reasons um, so one of them being the healthcare provider starts to automatically shift around when my um, sexuality is disclosed to them and that's my sexuality is probably only being disclosed to them to tell them that I'm not looking for pregnancy prevention at that time um, I've also had a lot of healthcare providers ask questions just out of personal curiosity, um, not professional, so they weren't relevant to the healthcare that was trying to be provided. They just felt like a personal question um, that they wanted to know. Um, and also sh ensuring sensitivity is shown when asking about certain top topics, um, in particular contraception in this example. Um, for example, a trans woman might have a GP appointment, um, might want to be asking about an estrogen prescription to aid their transition. Um, and, you know, sensitivity not being shown in that situation can really, really affect that outcome. And it can really affect how that person feels going forward with their transition. Also, a lesbian cisgender woman may only require contraception to control periods. So asking the relevant questions can not only save time, it can save uncomfortableness, and it can also save the person, I don't know, giving a bad review about that healthcare service to other friends who might need a similar service from them. And this, you know, will reduce the amount of people accessing services, um, and it will also have a long-term mental health effect for them as well. I also um, make a recommendation in ensuring that we record patients' identity correctly. Not only is this really empowering for LGBT people, um, but it also allows healthcare providers to be clear on the kind of services that are relevant to the individual. For example, a trans woman um, correctly being recorded as a trans woman and not a cisgender woman is important um, as it will ensure that they aren't sent letters for cervical screening, for example. 
um, and using the correct terminology is so important when talking to LGBT people um, and only where relevant as mentioned previously. So for example, um, when asking somebody a question about surgery that they may have undergone, only where relevant. An example um, that one of the clients that I work with, they got asked, have you still got a penis? Um, which is completely inappropriate. This should be changed to, have you undergone any lower surgery? And that should only um, be relevant depending on the kind of service you're providing. For example, when we provide sexual health services, we ask that to ensure that we're providing the right kit, the right sexual health testing kit for that person. Um, and, you know, so we're providing something that is relevant to them. We're not giving them the wrong kind of kit, which is not which is going to cause issues further on. Um, and another example of the correct terminology used, so if somebody says um, they are AFAB, that means assigned female at birth. If they are AMAB, that means that they are assigned male at birth. Also, something that I always recommend um, in service provision is knowledge is power and ensuring that your staff are filled with the correct knowledge can hopefully give them the confidence to answer questions for service users, give the best advice to patients and make them feel like they know what the correct terminology is and that always needs to be updated. Um, and one of the long, the long term goals for service providers could be to encourage a staff member or where resources are possible, assign somebody or um, assign a new job role um, for an LGBT representative. So that person would be responsible for keeping the whole team or the whole service up to date with current knowledge, um, you know, changing service where possible. Um, for example, one of the latest things would be updating a team, for example, on changes to PrEP medication for LGBT people so they know and understand and if um, a service user asks them the question then they know how to answer it confidently. Um, so obviously unfortunately we do hear only bad experiences that LGBT people have a lot of the time um, but luckily in my service we do get to hear some really really positive stories and thankfully that's where some of the recommendations I've made have been put into place in a service and the person has come, come away from that service feeling really empowered, feeling respected and feeling like they matter and they're not just passed off to the side because they don't fit the norm in a service. And one of the last thing, well, the last thing I will leave you with is that, you know, sometimes we get it wrong, even I get it wrong and I work in an LGBT service and I identify within the community myself. But the important thing is apologising and moving forward a lot of the time service providers can stumble um, and it can make it even more awkward, but just apologise, move on and try really hard not to make the same mistake again, especially when it comes to pronouns or gender identity, for example.